Hello everyone, I am Paul Ravindran. Today I'm going to talk to you about understanding IMRT. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge that several slides in this presentation were provided to me by Dr. Jerry Batista. Some of them I have animated, some of them I'm showing as is, but the credit goes to Dr. Jerry Batista and my acknowledgement and thanks to him for providing me those. In this uh, lecture, I'm going to talk to you about what is intensity modulated radiotherapy. I'll talk a little bit about the history of IMRT and how does the inverse planning work. And I'll also talk about the methods of IMRT delivery, such as a compensated based step and shoot and dynamic MLC. Volumetric arc therapy and tumor therapy, I will not uh, talk today, but I'll try to do it during another lecture, during another, in another lecture. What is IMRT? IMRT is delivery of conformal radiation to the patient via fields that have non-uniform radiation fluids. This technology of IMRT allows for conformal dose distribution around the tumor while rapid fall off of dose to the surrounding critical structures or normal structures. Initially, there were opinion that the terminology has been incorrectly established because strictly it is fluence, not the intensity that is modulated. However, we are now used to saying intensity modulated radiotherapy. How did IMRT evolve? If you all recollect, initially we were treating with square fields. As you can see here, we were using very uh, square or uh, rectangular fields. And... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just changing my point. I'll just use arrow. You can see these are the square fields that we used. Even for an irregular tumor like this, sometimes we used to shield at the middle or sometimes we used to seal the corner. When multi-leaf collimators came or when we could make conformal blocks, we were able to tailor the, you know, the field to the shape of the tumor. However, we gave a uniform dose within that shape. In intensity modulated radiotherapy, we were able to bring non-uniform dose fluence to get a dose distribution that is highly conformal to the tumor. So that's where the IMRT is different. IMRT could be delivered either with MLC or conformal block, but nowadays we mostly use multi-leaf collimator. I'll talk about that later. Let us do a small comparison between 3D CRT and IMRT. 3D CRT is a geometrical confirmation of radiotherapy in which the outline shape of each beam can be controlled, but the fluence is uniform, as I said. It has a uniform fluence, but the shape is controlled to the shape of the tumor volume. IMRT adds to the modulation possibility to 3D CRT. It adds modulation. It adds a fluence map to 3D CRT and combines both geometrical and fluence mapping. The geometry shape is also to, similar to that of 3D CRT and it also adds to that by providing an intensity modulation to the beam. If you look at this, you have a tumor volume which is here and here. If you do a lateral beam or any beam, you will be including most of this area where you have critical structures. Even if you do 3D CRT, let us forget alone a parallel post uh, beam, you will be including some of the normal tissues there. But when you do an IMRT, this is an IMRT with seven beams, as you can see here, you can sculpt the vision exactly to the tumor volume. As you can see here, you the critical organ is completely avoided when the dose is delivered to the tumor volume. So that is the advantage of IMRT. The IMRT techniques evolved with, from 1992 by different methods. Uh, initially, they used what they called NOMOS Mimic in 1992. Then multiple static field MLC technique. Uh, it started in 1994, but even now some of the uh, Linux provide uh, static IMRT. And dynamic MLC came in, which changed the method of delivery of IMRT. And most of the variant machines or dynamic, even Electra has dynamic MLC. And uh, scanning attenuation bar technique, that came in in 1995. And intensity modulated arc therapy came in. 
again in 1995 then the spiral tumor therapy concept came in in 1993 but actually it was started somewhere around 2001 and 2 uh, actually commercially it came up in 2003 if i if i'm right because uh, 2000 2000 one, I was working in uh, London Regional Cancer Centre in London, Ontario. One of the one of the beta testers for the tumor therapy. One of the three beta testers for uh, tumor therapy. Though I didn't have a chance to work, but I was able to look at the thing happening there during that time. Then volumetric modulated op therapy came in subsequently to that, which is now probably the standard of uh, um, method of delivering IMRT. Going a little into the history of IMRT, uh, it was started with the concept that Brahmi gave in 1982, where he solved an inverse problem of rotational beam fluence to deliver a uniform dose to a donut-shaped target. He did an inverse problem for it. It's something similar to what we do with our CT reconstruction by going back from the profiles, right? And uh, Brahmi first commercialized an MLC and he patented it and uh, he came up with an MLC concept in 1984 and in 1989 Dr. Webb came up with the uh, inverse planning problem as an optimization problem that minimizes the objective function that cost function then Boatfield came up uh, Thomas Boatfield came up with an algebraic iterative optimization problem and Boer et al also came up there are quite a few and uh, Rock Mackey came up with the helical tomotherapy in 1993 and uh, the concept of Brahmi's uh, theorem is something like this. Wherever you have a larger path length in the BTV, the fluence has to be higher. Wherever it passes through a smaller path length in the BTV or through a critical organ, the fluence has to be minimum. The, that is the concept you use as you can see here, where in here where the path length is more, the fluence is more. Here where the path length is less and there is a critical organ, the fluence is less. The same concept on this side also. So this is the original concept by which uh, he developed that inverse uh, thing. This is why the inverse, you go back and reduce the fluence or increase the fluence depending on the tumor size and the critical organ position. And on the left, I have given a small explanation on, suppose you want to avoid this central area and treat this circle. What you have to do is to have a beam where you close the central portion of the beam exactly to the size and do a full rotation it will create a fluence around the critical organ you know this is uh, how it is you want to avoid this and irradiate this right so if that is the case and this will be a good way of doing it you can try it to understand how it works what is inverse planning? I have been talking about inverse. I did mention that you have to work back and if the path length is more, you have a higher fluence. If the path length is less, have a lower fluence and things like that. But how does it work here? And inverse planning is in which you start with the dose criteria and let the computer design the beams. Normally, you design the beam and work with the dose distribution. Here, you say this has to be the dose. And for this dose, what should be the beam? What should be the fluence? You know, you work back like this. An important step in IMRT is the inverse planning. This is a process by which the optimum intensity distribution is determined by minimizing a cost function, an objective function. Instead of planner trying various permutation combination by changing beam weights, beam angle, beam size, even energy and things like that, the computer will now do trial and error or iterative method to arrive at a desired dose distribution. So that is why it's called inverse problem. The other one we call forward planning, right? You decide the beam, you decide the beam angle, you decide what is the beam weightage and that's referred to as the forward planning. The in inverse problem, there are actually two inverse problems involved in IMRT. The first inverse problem is to determine the fluence map or intensity modulation depending on where, where the tumor location is, what is the size of the tumor, where the critical organ is. It has to completely cover the tumor and as much as possible reduce the dose to the critical organ or the normal structures. So that is the number one inverse problem. The second inverse problem is to do that, you have decided on a fluence, but that fluence has to be delivered. To deliver the fluence, how the leaves will have to move. 
So you have to arrive at a leaf sequence for it. So that is the second inverse problem. But in the current, most of the planning system, including the VMAT planning, the first inverse problem and the second inverse problem are combined and it is called direct aperture optimization. In the original one, when you do the fluence map, you don't know what the aperture is going to be. Then you have to do another uh, inverse problem to arrive at an aperture to deliver the fluence map. In the direct aperture optimization, both are combined. Most of the VMAT works, the VMAT actually works like that. And we will discuss that another day. And the Shepard et al. suggested an automated planning system in which they bypass the traditional intensity optimization and instead directly optimize the shape and weights of the aperture. They directly got the aperture when they were doing the fluence map itself. So this is called direct aperture optimization. Let us look at uh, the inverse plan, how it works, a little bit about that. What are these objectives? To minimize sum of absolute differences between the prescribed and delivered dose. That is the objective. When you do an IMRD, your objective is to minimize the difference between the prescribed and delivered dose. In other words, the delivered dose should be equal to the prescribed dose. The difference should be as minimum as possible. Minimize sum of quadratic difference between the prescribed and the delivered. So what you have looking at is the planned minus delivered square. That minimize the weighted integral dose, maximize the minimum dose to the target. This is the objective. Here we use a cost function. IMRT treatment plan parameters are determined by means of optimization procedure on an appropriate cost function. You have to have a cost function and that is used for optimization. The cost function is the measure of the distance between, I would say difference between the prescribed dose and the determined or calculated dose. You prescribe a dose and you calculate a dose, the difference between them should be as small as possible. That is what is, you want to minimize that cost function, right? The cost function includes the clinical objectives of the treatment plan. It can be based on a dose criteria, which is called the physical cost function, or biological criteria, which is referred to as the biological cost function. The biological cost function can be considered more efficient than a dose volume cost function. That's what people uh, feel, but the only criteria there is you must know the parameters for radiobiological models very well. Unl uh, unless you know that, your biological cost function will not be as accurate as you expect that to be. Like, I would prefer to go with a physical cost function if you are not very comfortable with that. So, how do you minimize the cost function? Instead of matching a desired dose distribution, you have to have a cost function. It also can be called figure of merit. The cost function is the average target dose minus desired dose plus average OER dose by the dose limit to the OER. So this is referred to as the cost function. So optimization is by search algorithm. You can use different algorithm to uh, optimize this. One is the inversion or filtered projection or trial and error or steep gradient search or simulated annealing. You try to somewhere come somewhere here these are all called the local minima. You have to come to the global minima to achieve the cost function. Now, objective function, the example, what I have been saying is, this is the equation that they use. This is the dose at a voxel. You are looking, calculation goes by voxel. The dose at the voxel in the OER and the tolerance dose, right? And the square of that, plus this is actually called the constraint operator and this is the weightage and this you do for every voxel or every OER, right? You have to do for all the OER from J is so 1 to K and at every voxel you do the calculation. This is the equation for that. But in the present day, the optimization is slightly advanced now. It is eventually recognized that optimization based on simple dose objectives and constraints such as minimum dose, maximum dose did not yield satisfactory results. Therefore, the dose volume limits were introduced for further improvements. Today, the dose volume objective constraints are essential in most commercial inverse planning system. They go by dose volume objectives than actually a dose objective. So, the volume is always known. 
most of you working with IMRT will know volume is very important, V95, V98, you know. So the dose volume objective is what is currently used. Another optimization approach in, in between pure physical dose objective and biological planning is the effective uniform dose. There is something between this. It is neither completely biological planning nor completely physical. It is the effective uniform dose, UD they call it, that is used for base uh, inverse planning nowadays. UD is the dose that when homogeneously given to an organ or structure is the same biological clinical effect as a given non-uniform dose. So the whether it is a homogeneous or non-homogeneous, it will give the same biological effect. That is what is called the effective uniform dose. So the iterative method works like that. You initially take some weights, compute the dose distribution, determine the update factors, and then go and do the recompute the dose distribution. If it is acceptable, you finish. Otherwise, go update it and then again do it. It's like iterative till you get the minimum cost function, the as low as the smallest cost function, you keep on doing it and then you say it is acceptable, you finish, stop that. So now you have got an intensity map by doing your optimization. Now you have to have deliver the intensity map. This is what is the intensity map to deliver, let me say, a particular dose distribution. And this is uh, normally when you use with the multi-leaf collimator, you have an MLC, so you define beamlets. This is the beam length and the width of the beam length it will be the width of the multi-leaf collimator. Of course, the length can be changed depending on what type of um, delivery you do, right? And the next step is to deliver this intensity pattern. Of course, as I said earlier, you can use a compensator which is uh, will provide much smoother but it has its own problems and you can use MLC. When you use a compensator, Physically, you have to make compensators. Let me say you use a 7 beam IMRT. You have to make 7 compensators for it to deliver affluence. But the advantage is you don't go by the beam let size like width and all. You don't worry. You can make it very smooth. Right. So that is an advantage. But the disadvantages are many. You have to make for each field and you have to go in and replace the compensator correctly for each one. And you need to find storage place for all the days of treatment and use it again uh, regularly on every day. So, in that way, this multi-leaf collimator based is much, much more convenient, right? So, that's how it changed uh, MLC based uh, IMRT. Uh, so, multi-leaf collimator came like you have, I'm not going into the details of the shape and, the, you know, how the penumbra and all those uh, leakage and all. Uh, that we will discuss in another class. So, this is the multi-leaf collimator that you see. This was from Siemens and this is the variant. This is on a carriage. You know, and this can now be used to deliver uh, a fluence map. How it happens? Um, you have multiple segments made and you can combine all them to make a fluence. For example, if I knew I need a fluence like this, I can have three segments. If I combine all this, I get this fluence map. Right. So it is actually a translator intensity map to leaf position. So I need this intensity map. What should be the leaf position? There are two methods of doing it. One is called the step and shoot. The other one is called the sliding window. I'm not going to talk about the VMAT today, but let us, these are old, but they are still being, they are still being used. Several planning systems use that. So it's also, you need to know, one needs to know how it all evolved. So it's good to know this and it's quite interesting also. So step and shoot is where the beam is off when the leaves move. So it forms a shape, it radiates, beam stops and it forms another shape and the beam is on now and after irradiation the beam stops it forms another shape. So the segments the otherwise I call the shapes are formed and during the formation of that there is no beam when it's it's completely formed the radiation beam is on. So this is called step and shoot IMRT. Sliding window is one when the leaves move the radiation beam is on. So the intensity or fluence map is obtained by varying the velocity and the position of the leaf and also the direction which includes in the velocity and which leaf is to open and close you know those are decided there let us look at both how actually happened this is where uh, the interesting part of this step and shoot and sliding window and i have some animation to show you 
Let us say you need a fluence map like this. That means here you want, let me say, is 3 mu, here you want 4 mu, here you want 2 mu, here again 5 mu and 4 mu. So this is a fluence map like this. How do you achieve this? Let me first look at step and shoot method. This is, I call it one dimensional. You are looking at only one leaf movement to deliver one fluence in one dimension. Then we will go to two dimension after this. We will just uh, uh, separate them as A1, A2, A3 where the dose has to be, B1, B2, B3 where you don't need to give the dose. Okay. Let me now bring in the leaves. Now, this is the fluence that you have to get as you can see here and the leaves are here. For example, if I read it now, I can actually read it up to 3 mu, right? Basically, because if I read it more than that, this will get irradiation. This area will get irradiation. So let us see how we do this. Now, I read it 2 mu here, right? I deliver only 2 and then I move this and deliver again 1 mu. It is completely open. So I delivered 1 mu because I can't deliver more than 1 then it will become more than 3 mu here. And this is fine because I need 4. I have gone up to 3 and the rest of the area is fine. Now here I cannot deliver more than this. So I have to now close this. Please also remember we have done 2 irradiation. First 2 mu and then 1 mu. So 2 segments done. Now I close A and open B on the other side. Now again now here I have to give only 1 mu. If I give more than 1, then here also I have to give only 1. So I will just deliver 1 mu to this entire area. This is my third segment. Now I got this after 1 mu is delivered. Now I have to deliver 3 mu here and 3 mu here. But I should not deliver anything in this area. So I have to close this up to here. So now the A is closed. And now I deliver 3 mu. So I got the profile. In that, we did one segment here, right? Another segment here for 1 mu, and another segment for 1 mu, then here 2 mu, 2 mu, 1 mu, 1 mu, and 3 mu. So four segments we were able to get what we wanted, the profile we want. Now this is a one dimension one. Let us look at it in two dimension like a fluence. Okay. This is a two dimension fluence, which let me say here, I want to give, let me say seven gray here, 10 gray here, five gray here, eight gray, nine gray here. How do I do it? Here I use a formula, which is basically two power n. When I put n, uh, let me say I put two power four, the value will be 16. I don't have anywhere 16 gray. So I cannot use that. That n has to be one less than what is maximum. I mean, it has to be within the maximum, not one less than within the maximum that you need. So if I take 2 power 3, it will be 8. So I will go with 2 power 3 now. So which is 8 mu. And these are the areas I can deliver 8 mu. This is my segment number 1. If you ask me why you are not opening anything, there is no other area where you need more than 8 mu. So I should not have more segments than that. So I deliver 8 mu here. And once I deliver 8, it becomes 2 and this becomes 1 and this becomes 0 and this becomes 1. Now, one segment is delivered. Now I go to 2 power 2, that is 4. I see where it is 4 and more and open that. But I'm not opening here because the, even though this is 4 and more, I have 2 here. If I move the leaf here, the 2 will get more dose than that. So I have to split this into two segments. So one segment, once I deliver here, this now becomes 1, 3, 1, 0 and 3. Now I have to still do 4, 7 and all this side. So I give another segment here where again I deliver 4 mu. So once I deliver 4 mu, this becomes 0, 3, 1, 1, 3 and 0. So now I have delivered 3 segments, 8 mu, 1, 4 mu, 2 segments, right? Now I go to 2 power 1, which is 2. Now I will deliver wherever it is 2 and more with this 2 mu. So what do I do? I open wherever it is 2 and more, 3 here. Here is 3, but I can't open because I need 0 here. 
even though there is a two and three. So I this is my first segment, which will be my fourth segment, right? So I now deliver two MU here. Then what is left is one zero and one one and zero here, right? So that's what is left. But still you have three two here, three two here, three here and two here. So I have to open that. Now I open that. So this is my fifth segment and deliver two MU. I got everything. Now I have maximum one MU. So my uh, formula here is two power zero. So two power zero is one. So I will deliver one MU. What do I do now? I deliver one MU to wherever it is one. I open only that. This is my sixth segment. Once I deliver, it becomes zero. Then I go and see wherever it is one again on the other side and I deliver here and it all becomes zero. So with seven segments, we are completed to get the fluence map. So this is how the segments are decided in a step and shoot IMRT. Let us now look at a dynamic uh, window. So that will be a little interesting. Uh, before that, I would like to tell you uh, in 2006 or seven, one of my students uh, who did project with me developed a uh, software to using this, uh, you know, two power n formula to have a uh, um, leaf sequencing to deliver a fluence map. What she did was she took my photograph, converted into a fluence map and did, this, did the leaf sequence. We delivered it and this is the one, but that time it was one centimeter leaf MLC. So you don't really see it very clearly, but this is me. Now let us go to the sliding window. In the sliding window, the leaf has to be completely moving when the beam is on. Suppose you need a profile where it is to be increasing, what you have to do is you have to move this and wherever up to, up to the point you want keep the leaf B, right? So I will show you when you want an increasing profile, leaf A is moving, as it moves, it gives, the radiation is on, it gives. So there will be more doors on this side because this portion was open longer time, this portion was open lesser time. So you have an increasing profile. Suppose you want a decreasing profile, you have to close the B, as you have seen here, and then start moving it from this direction. So as you move it, you get the decreasing profile. So you know how to make an increasing profile and you know how to make a decreasing profile. The steepness of the profile can be changed by changing the velocity of the leaf. Let us look, you want an arbitrary one, where you have two different types of you know, up and down and you know, valley and hill and things like that. So you have two leaves here. One I call it leading leaf. The other one is called the trailing leaf when you want to move both. So in this case, first what I do is a trailing leaf moves, you get an increasing profile. And the leading leaf moves, you get a decreasing profile. Again, you get an increasing, again, you get a decreasing profile. So you can make any arbitrary profile like this to get any fluence map. For example, if you want a steeper positive gradient, faster leading leaf and slower trailing leaf. If you want a steep negative gradient like this, you need a slower leading leaf and faster trailing leaf. So with this combination, you can deliver any shape you want. So let us look at a desired profile. This is my profile I want. How am I going to do this? The profile is such I need to start with 80. CGY or MU and go up to 100 CGY and here I should have only 50 and here I should have 100. So how do I do this? Let us first move B to this point and deliver 50 MU. Right? B is moved to that point while that time 50 MU is done. So this one keeps increasing because it is now moving from here to here and 50 MU is delivered. So I get the same slope here. Right? So the next one is I move the B fast to the other end and then deliver 30 MU with everything open. So it's almost same everywhere, right? It's almost same everywhere when everything is open. So I now 50 plus 30, I got up to 80 MU. Now I have to get this. Of course, this is no problem. <coughs> I'm sorry. And then I have to get this. So now what I do is I move A to the edge and start doing this and I deliver 20 MU, I have an increment like this. So only this 
increasing doses obtained, the rest are all the same throughout. So it was completely open. The last thing is I need to have this increasing profile. To get this increasing profile, I have to bring this A here and then move B from here to here. Am I right? So I brought here, then, oh sorry, moving A from here to there. So I got an increase. So I got whatever I wanted. I hope uh, this was useful. And uh, if you have any questions, you put it on the comments. If time permits, I would like to answer. If you have any suggestion on topics, if I know those uh, topics that you want, I'd be happy to provide a lecture on that. Thank you very much for looking at it. And if you like this, give a thumbs up.